I left my hometown, Konstanz, um, just a few days ago on Thursday, very early in the morning, to travel to Tallinn. Um, this day <clears throat> was called Thurs um, Dirty Thursday, due to carnival rides which start on this very morning. It turned out, however, that it was the dirtiest Thursday ever. And it is due to this that I would like to dedicate my paper this morning to my <clears throat> Ukrainian friends and to my Russian friends who have the courage to stand up and speak out against this war. Now, <clears throat> dear Marek, thank you so much for this generous introduction, also for bringing me to Tallinn back again to speak today on the hero of our conference. <clears throat> so, dear friends, dear family, and dear fans of Yuri Lotman, it is a huge distinction and honor for me to speak in this place here about Lotman. I religiously read his books as a student in the 1970s. Structuralism and semiotics were the new languages that inspired my generation. Thank you for your generous in invitation, which gives me now the opportunity to enter into a dialogue with Lotman's works over half a century. In the 1970s and 80s, Yuri Lotman revolutionized our concept of culture. He defined cultures as science systems or semiospheres that allow members of a collective to inhabit a common world. According to his semiotic theory, a culture produces a self-description and a set of texts and symbols, promoting not only common norms and values, but also a shared pool of references for general communication. Like language, culture is a semiotic system of codes with a specific grammar, generating meaning and enabling communication. Lotman also defined culture as a, su a supra-individual intellect and as a common language that unites various languages into a higher unity and thus combines diverse individuals into a thinking whole. <clears throat> As our intellectual upbringing took place in the heydays of structuralism and the rise of semiotics, we were from the very start familiar with Lotman's language and assimilated it easily with our own ideas, concerns, or projects. We gladly embraced his technical meta-language for culture and found it liberating because it opened new ways for reflection beyond conservative definitions and discourses. Lotman also helped us to avoid essentializing pitfalls when speaking about cultures, and he demystified the term by describing it as a semiotic system and operative process. But, of course, what attracted us most and had a lasting significance for us was the fact that Lotman introduced the influential metaphor of cultural memory in order to describe this system of collective sign production by a society in a common territory. The famous definition that he published together with his colleague Boris Uspensky, whom we had the pleasure to listen to uh, last night, this essay in 1971 hit us with the force of a revelation and became our mantra to this day. I quote, <clears throat> we understand culture <clears throat> as the non-hereditary memory of a community, thus defining memory, <clears throat> a memory that is not relying on genes but on signs, and expressing itself in a system of constraints and prescriptions. That was a fresh perspective and brand new language indeed. Lotman was the pioneer who opened up the self-contained circles also of the humanities in the academy and offered points of contact with new disciplines, such as information technology and neuroscience. 
Computer science <clears throat> was growing fast at the time, and terms like ROM, reading-only memory, or RAM, random access memory, confirmed the importance of memory for the new machines that, were just, that we were just then starting to handle. Lottmann, of course, did not refer to computing machines, but he used the analogy between individual and collective memory. If we regard <clears throat> the collective as a more complex, organized, complexly organized individual, culture may be understood by analogy with the individual mechanisms <clears throat> of memory as a certain collective mechanism for the storage and processing of information. The semiotic structure of culture and the semiotic structure of memory are function functionally uniform phenomena situated on different levels. Just like individual consciousness has its mechanisms of memory, so collective consciousness, upon discovering the need to fix something shared in common by the whole collective, creates the mechanism of collective memory. He pointed out the structural similarities when emphasizing the three fundamental functions of culture, namely preservation, transmission, and creation. Lottmann's metaphor and model of memory culture went, however, far beyond the storing of materials and included always the capacity for generating new texts, messages, messages and meanings. Ideas are not stored in cultural memory, they grow there, one of important sentences, or memory is not a passive storehouse for culture but a constructive part of its text-generating mechanism. Lottmann introduced memory <clears throat> also as a counterterm to history in order to describe the non-linear temporality that organizes the text of a culture. While history stands for a linear temporality that is exclusively oriented towards the future, memory stands for a temporality in which the past does not automatically disappear, but retains its own energy and can be reactivated for the future. In this respect, memory works against the grain of linear history, producing duration in transience, valuing the old and the new, the past in the present. The specific temporality of memory <clears throat> creates temporal duration and identity or recognizability a sameness in variability that allows people from different ages and perspectives to participate and share the same culture across time. While the time of history is linear, the time of cultural memory is synchronic or panchronic. This means that every epoch can be revived in art, <clears throat> every trace can be reactivated and reintroduced into the present. Lottmann therefore rejects Hegel's philosophy of history that ignores this active role of memory in the creation of new texts and makes the point that memory is not ahistorical but <clears throat> antihistorical because it resists time, preserving the past as an inhabitant of the present. In another seminal essay, um, <clears throat> Published in 1977, Lottmann and Uspensky wrote, the essence of culture is such that the past contained in it doesn't, does not depart into the past as in the natural flow of time, it does not disappear. It becomes fixed in cultural memory and acquires a permanent, if background, presence. This short and concise description covers a lot of ground which, more or less at the same time, became the focus of our own research. And here I include Jan Asman into <coughs> our panel. Outside <coughs> the walls um, of the university, which I had to leave for 12 years for raising a family and childcare, during this time we formed um, an informal research group which started in 1997. <clears throat> it started in 1997 with a comparative study of the role uh, of orality and literacy 
Schrift und Gedächtnis in shaping cultural memory. And it continued in the early 1980s with further topics dealing with text textual canonization <coughs> in different ancient cultures. While Lottmann created his theory of cultural memory by himself or in dialogue with his friends and colleagues, Jan and myself pursued our project in the form of a longer series of collaborative research involving colleagues from different fields and many specialists also from non-European cultures. While Lottmann pursued the topic of cultural memory with his semiotic methodology, studying culture as a kind of language, grammar or structure, we pursued it <clears throat> with our more historical and anthropological equipment as a set of concrete practices and institutions. When I now move from cultural memory to memory culture, I want to highlight more specifically a meaning of cultural memory, which we can more generally define as the, ex the experience of the past and its changing reinterpretation in the present. This perspective was already adumbrated by Lottmann and Uspensky when they wrote, in so far as culture is memory, or in other words, a record of the memory of what the community has experienced, it is of necessity connected to past historical experience. I can offer here a personal testimony for the rise of this new definition of cultural memory. <clears throat> in August 1989, the venerable Russian intellectual, author, and humanist, uh, human, human rights activist Lev Kopilev gave a talk in a little village in the Algoi Alps. It was organized by an influential German journalist called Harry Pross, <clears throat> who uh, had invited this guest to his summer house. Kopilev spoke to an international group of young people, and I was in the audience. At the time, the Russian dissenter lived in German exile, but had just been granted a visit to Moscow by Gorbachev. Directly after his return, Kopilev told us in a tone of highest agitation and deepest concern of two rival Russian groups with whom he had just spoken. Both groups made it their project to salvage Russian memory in the time of perestroika. Their names were Pamyat, a group bent on recovering national memory that had been repressed during the communist era, and Memorial, a group bent on recovering the memory of the Gulag. Later on, nowadays, the memory activists of Pamyat helped Putin construct a new national memory, whereas the activists of Memorial became an NGO that collected the traces of Stalinist crimes and honored the names of its victims. 30 years later, the Pamyat activists have made their way to the top of the state and back up now Putin's war against Ukraine. While Memorial was sentenced before court as a foreign agent in December and abolished by the government the end of last year. There were other important sites and debates on memory in the 1980s and 90s. An obvious example is the rise, the global rise of Holocaust memory, which arrived in Germany after four decades after a leaden silence in mainstream society, state and institutions. This changed considerably when many Holocaust survivors turned into witnesses who finally found a hearing, a resonance in the society. The decades after 1945 were now retrospectively termed as a period of forgetting. In the summer of 1989, Fukuyama had published an influential essay with the title, The End of History. Looking back, at this moment of transformation in a longer perspective, however, we can say that the collapse of communism was not the end of history, but 
the beginning of memory. From now on, history and memory emerged in a new constellation of terms that had to be renegotiated. This was the political and cultural climate in which we embraced Lottmann's concept of cultural memory and developed our own. But it took some time until we were able to place our own research more squarely in the changing world that we ourselves inhabited. In Lottmann's semiotic universe, <clears throat> the interplay between remembering and forgetting is the motor that drives the dynamics of cultural memory. What Freud assumed with respect to the unconscious, Lottmann assumed for the economy of cultural memory, that there is no final erasure, but only a temporary neutralization of signs. At this point, I would like to give Lottmann's theory of the dynamics of cultural memory a little bit more scope, context, and complexity. Starting from the analogy of individual memory, my first point is that <clears throat> individual memory has different registers. We memorize items that we do not want to forget, fixing them permanently as knowledge in our brain and keep keeping them steadily available in the present. We remember items in our memory after they had temporarily disappeared from the screen of our consciousness. Remembering, as Lottmann rightly points out, always involves a possible reference to a previous item or state of information. For me, this is corroborate, corroborated by the fact that many words of Latin origin relating to operations of memory start with the uh, proposition, um, preposition re, namely re, member, remind, recall, recollect, renaissance, recordare, up to the return of the repressed. This linguistic feature implies that in acts of remembering, there's always um, something that is retrieved or comes back of its own accord, which does not need <clears throat> it to be the same as the initial stimulus. My second point concerns <clears throat> the underlying mechanism of return that is presupposed in the act of remembering. The return of a personal memory, as Proust has shown with his famous analysis of involuntary memory, can never be taken for granted, nor rely on a mere mechanism or grammar, but depends <clears throat> on more concrete preconditions. In the realm of cultural memory, such a recovery on, uh, of an earlier impulse is only possible if specific provisions are built into the cultural institutions. One of the props or provisions is organized repetition in time. The other is material preservation in space. In the dimension of time, cultural memory, like individual memory, is dependent on external impulses or triggers. Religious rites and anniversaries are scheduled dates that serve several functions. In historical anniversaries, a society reenacts key events of its history. You just celebrated <clears throat> yesterday, <clears throat> Uh, day, yeah, day before yesterday, your um, Independence Day. So <clears throat> these days form a framework for collective self-staging. They offer occasions for personal participation in events and stimulate debates and reflections that update and critically also renew the historical consciousness and position of a society. The role <clears throat> that the trigger plays in in the dimension of time corresponds to the function of the trace or the material duration and material duration in the dimension of space. For something <clears throat> that is temporarily removed from consciousness, there must be a place where it can hide or endure. I refer to this intermediary stage as latency. The word comes from the Latin latere, to conceal or to hide. Archaeology can always yield traces for an unexpected return, involuntary return, as it were, 
Um, as, <clears throat> but Western historical culture has also created its special institutions, namely the archive, the historical archive and the museum, and the library for the material duration of objects and texts, enabling a re-encounter with the past. Most of the cultural texts collected in these institutions have lost their contexts and messages, have become neutralized, as it were, but they are not swept away in the river of time, but remain latent until they are rediscovered and recontextualized. What Proust's Mémoire en Volontaire is for the individual, institutions like the archive, the library, or the museum are for the cultural memory a reservoir and a background of latent memories that have their hour behind them <clears throat> or still ahead of them. Lottmann is absolutely right when he distinguishes memory from a mere storing device and emphasizes its generating force. In cultural memory, however, <clears throat> the steering function of canonized memory and the storing function of the historical archive have to interact. Archives are not the opposite of cultural memory, but an essential part of it. There is no cultural remembering in Western cultures without historical archives, and there is no critical assessment and transformation without this important resource. Where there are no traces, <clears throat> where nothing is continuously set aside, assiduously collected, filed, ordered, kept in store, there is no chance to recover and reinterpret what is forgotten. The concept of latency can also help to describe the dynamics between remembering, forgetting, and re-remembering in the visual dimension of public space. In 1927, Robert Musil wrote a short piece on the invisibility of monuments. He was struck by the paradox that monuments are erected in the center of public spaces to memorialize people and events, but their stable presence has often the very opposite effect. <clears throat> they are automatically overlooked by passers-by and therefore should rather be called monuments to oblivion. Due to their monumental presence, they fail to attract attention, lose their semioticity, and fade into a neutral background. The same phenomenon, however, can be interpreted differently if we introduce an argument made much later by <clears throat> sociologist Nicol Niklas Luhmann. Fifty years later, his concept of protection through latency or by latency can help <clears throat> us understand why monuments uh, with central positions in the urban environment <clears throat> that had been taken for granted have suddenly now, right now, uh, become provocative and even unbearable as they moved into the focus of excited attention and heated discussions. The recent iconoclastic practices initiated by the Black Lives Matter movement are an obvious indication that Musil overlooked an important dimension when writing about the invisibility of monuments. Invisibility means inertia and semiotic inactivity, but there's also something else involved. Invisible power is the most effective form of power. The very fact that monuments and sim symbols are not seen can also be taken as a confirmation of their agreed normative function and assured function. It is precisely because we do not see them anymore that monuments fulfill their normative cultural function. Invisibility must therefore not be confused with absence. Invisible presence stabilizes statues and symbols in the semiotic system of a culture, shielding them against interventions and change. <clears throat> Luhmann describes the protection through latency as, um, here I quote him, as a structural safeguard against change. If structures need the protection of latency, he writes, this does not mean that awareness or communication would be impossible, <clears throat> but it only means that awareness or communication would destroy structures or trigger considerable restructuring. This possibility will be evaded as long as lat latency prevails, blocking awareness and communication. 
Luhmann did not have monuments in mind when he wrote these sentences, but he could not have found a better example for his argument. The abrupt return of certain monuments from invisibility to visibility, which we have witnessed um, in recent months and continue to witness, has foregrounded the loss of latency and the precarious state of ultra-visibility. What had been hidden for decades or centuries in the commonplace background of urban environment, namely a shameful history of colonial exploitation and slavery, has all of a sudden come back to life and moved into the center of heated debates and actions. This inbuilt resistance to change had obviously expired due to the death of George Floyd and the activities of the Black Lives Matter movement. Awareness and communication triggered, um, in, um, tri triggered significant restructuring. Let me give you an example <clears throat> for such a precarious visibility from my city of Konstanz. Some months ago, a letter was recently stolen from the facade of a building. It was an M that had caused offense and is now hidden in an unknown place. The pharmacy in question changed its name in the process. It has become the Ohren Apotheke, in German it would be Ears uh, Pharmacy, instead of Mohren Apotheke. The passers-by perceived the name change with different sentiments. Many emphasized the offense of the theft and the damage of the facade. For me, it is a challenge and a sudden shock of recognition. The Konstanz citizens are learning right now to look at their own history through the eyes of those who were not born <clears throat> there or whose ancestors experienced <clears throat> um, this history from a very different perspective. The controversies and debates that we are currently witnessing in many countries and cities are a signal that this reflection has only just started and that a hitherto excluded history is penetrating the consciousness of the dominant society. And this again could mean that there is a possibility that public knowledge, consciousness and memory frames are being expanding <clears throat> and national narratives reconstructed. I will move on to two um, political speeches. The first is by Emmanuel Macron. Since the 1990s, memory has become an issue that is much discussed and content, uh, contested on all levels of the society. Individual level, generational level, political level, national level. More and more politicians today feel the obligation to take up memory issues, to respond to pressures, and to confront chapters in their history that had disappeared from public consciousness. My first example comes from a speech that President Emmanuel Macron gave in June 2020 on his <clears throat> measures in the COVID pandemic. Towards the end, however, he addresses his politics of memory without relating to the recent murder of George, uh, George Floyd in Minnesota and the Black Lives Matter movement that was spreading very quickly at that time in May 2020. I am telling you this very clearly tonight, he said, my dear compatriots, the Republic will not erase any trace or any name from its history. The Republic will not take down any statue. Rather, we must lucidly look together at all of our history, all our memories, our relationship with Africa in particular, in order to build a present and a possible future from one side of the Mediterranean to the other with a will for truth and no intention whatsoever to revisit or deny who we are. This statement is bold and clear, but it raises a few questions. Why does he emphasize that he will not destroy any traces or manipulate the history of the state? Doesn't he live in a democracy where independent historians watch over history and its traces are enshrined in the historical archive? And what does he mean exactly when he says that he will be the guardian of all our history, all our memories? 
This declaration conflates history and memory. Both are equally sacrosanct, but if the state takes the responsibility over all the traces of history, how much and which part of it is to be committed to memory, Macron levels the difference between history and memory. While history is always all-inclusive and can, in principle, accommodate any event, memory, on the other hand, is extremely limited in its range and can only adopt, adopt a very small number of key events, symbolic key events, that are of abiding relevance for the self-image of a collective. There's a wonderful... <clears throat> a meta symbol of memory in a 17th century emblem book, uh, which depicts memory as a bottle with an extremely um, narrow neck. The caption reads, the greatest part is lost. So this is the relationship between history, the book up there with all the facts, and the very few uh, little drops that make it into the bottle. Um, the field <coughs> of history has no bottleneck. It's more like a book or a library. It is able to expand, expand quickly, but this expansion in quantity does not affect the society. When it comes to memory, however, the inclusion of a new uh, memory becomes a national enterprise involving memory activists, public debates, and political decisions in a democracy. Macron's speech revolves around the quantity of traces and monuments in France. In the name of truth, he promises that not a single item will disappear. Forgetting, however, is not only a matter of material destruction, it also is affected through strategies of exclusion. Friedrich Nietzsche had already pointed to this exclusion mechanism based on human emotions when he wrote this little aphorism. I have done it says my memory. I cannot have done it, says my pride, and stays adamant. Finally, memory gives in. Pride is a personal, but it is also a very political emotion. National memories are traditionally premised on pride. It is their function to generate pride, emphasize honor, and elevate this collective self-image. After Nietzsche, Maurice Halbwax gave us important clues concerning forgetting and remembering when he introduced his constructivist theory of frames, like in the 1920s. Like Lotman's concept of cultural memory, a frame is a system of constraints and prescriptions. The frame mediates between the group and the individual. It signals what members of the group can share collectively or should better keep to themselves. This creates social pressure and cohesion through a normative logic of adoption and conformism. The frame is an important selection mechanism, in other words. <clears throat> it neatly separates what is relevant from what has, no, uh, has to remain outside and is thus excluded, silenced, or forgotten. Besides material destruction and the pressure of a frame, there is a third form of forgetting, which is exclusion by a dominant narrative. While the frame can be expanded under cultural pressure from below to introduce more information and events that had hitherto no chance of figuring in the collective memory, a dominant frame it has itself to change in order to adopt a more inclusive interpretation of the past. A collective narrative, for instance, that is premised exclusively on victory or on victimhood would require a shift of paradigm and a re-narration. Such an admission of a different perspective would not only change the narrative, it would also transform the collective self-image, and here I give you next, my next example, the political speech by John, Joe Biden in 2021. <clears throat> this is the speech that <clears throat> Biden gave a year after Macron um, on June the 1st, 20, 2021, 20, 20, in t uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. The occasion was the 100th um, anniversary, another external trigger, 
uh, of um, temporal trigger, uh, commemorating a lynching massacre, <clears throat> a hate crime of a white mob that killed many black people, burned 1,200 1, houses, and left 10,000 people uh, of a flourishing community homeless and terrorized. These are now the words of the Biden speech that I want to bring to your attention. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence and cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it does not mean that it did not take place. While darkness can hide much, it erases nothing. Some injustices are so heinous, so horrific, so grievous, grievous they can't be buried no matter how hard people try. We can't choose to learn what we want to know and not what we should know. We should know the good, the bad, everything. That's what great nations do. They come to terms with their dark sides, and we are a great nation. The only way to build a common ground is to truly repair and rebuild. I come here to fill the silence, because in silence, wounds deepen, and painful as it is, only in remembrance do wounds heal. We just have to choose to remember. We memorialize what has happened here in Tulsa, so it can't be erased. Like the speech of Macron, Biden's speech expresses a strong commitment to truth, referring to the whole history of, the, of, of a great nation. But Biden's speech focuses clearly on memory work that implicates, implicates every citizen of the state. He emphasizes the difficulties of such memory work and the long period of latency before such a commitment can take shape, 100 years in this case, which in, <clears throat> yeah, in dictatorships, history and memory are isomorphic, and it is up to the head of the state to define both. But in a democracy, there can be impediments and obstacles that obstruct the search for historical truth. It is at stake if one part of the society does not want to learn about the crimes of their ancestors. And even though there are historical accounts and ample personal testimonies of witnesses, it does not follow that an event has a firm place in the history or memory of a nation. To quote Biden, just because history is silent, it does not mean that it did not <clears throat> take place. While darkness can hide mu much, it erases nothing. To this day, American national memory is utterly segregated. There is no consensus in the white population that they should join the memory of the black victims of their common history. Once more, Biden, we can't choose to learn what we want to know and not what we should know. We should know the good, the bad, everything. That's what great nations do. This appeal is backed up by an ethical imperative, in a sense of an exclamation mark, because that's also what imperatives are. And as the first white president ever to take, have taken part in this black commemoration ceremony, Biden not only contributes to memorializing the event and anchoring, and anchoring it in history, but he also appeals to his fellow Americans to join in the commemoration. He tells the story in extenso in order to transform the event into a historical record and a living memory. In this respect, Biden's <clears throat> speech is a performative act, trying to establish, a sh to establish a shared memory for all Americans. When he promised that he will make sure that Americans know the story of Tulsa in full, he was embarking on a difficult and long-term project. It involves changing the national narrative to include what had been systematically excluded. In Lottmann's theory, the rush of time is a force that hastens forgetting. Everything has its expiry dates and sooner or later loses its hold over the present. But not only time rules over the economy of memory. As we have seen, political systems and cultural paradigms can change abruptly, transforming values together with the norms for what is henceforth to be remembered and what is to be forgotten. 
A rather different dimension in the dynamics of remembering and forgetting was addressed by American writers in the 1930s and 60s. The past is never dead, it's not even past, wrote William Faulkner in his novel Requiem for a Nun in 1931. Forty years later, James Baldwin echoed Faulkner when he wrote in one of his essays, White man hear me, history, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely to, or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. The paradoxical formula, a past that does not pass, gained considerable currency as a definition of trauma when it was first acknowledged as a medical di diagnosis in 1980. Trauma is a psychic injury related <clears throat> to unexpected and unbearable experiences of violence that is immune against the passing of time and resists the normal process of fading out and receding into the past. For this reason, the pathology of trauma has also been defined as a presence of an absence and was therefore frequently associated in art or public discourse with the trope of ghost and haunting. President Biden asserted <clears throat> addressed this effect of trauma when he said, in silence, wounds deepen, and painful as it is, only in remembrance do wounds heal. And here with, I come to my conclusions. The concern for remembering as a form of therapy was of course very far from Lottmann's semiotic theory, but I'm convinced that he would have been interested in strategies of forgetting, and ending toxic histories and memories that perpetuate racism, anti-Semitism, and continue to induce systemic violence. Directly after the Second World War, Hannah Arendt had already referred to imperialism and genocide as the subterranean stream of Western history that surfaced with the crimes of the Holocaust. She wrote the preface to this book, we can no longer afford to take that which was good in the past and simply call it our heritage, to discard the bad and simply think of it as a dead load which by itself time will bury in oblivion. A transnational memory of the Holocaust was formed um, in 2000 to educate citizens and create awareness, but the subterranean stream carries further toxic histories of racism that have not yet been addressed nor worked through in <clears throat> white communities. It was Baldwin's message that events are not necessarily over when they pass into history. History is not the same as the historical archive. It is also a cultural reservoir for historically defeated worldviews, outdated self-images and attitudes. Long after the abolition of slavery, this historical trauma has not ended for those who are implicated. As long as the values and attitudes that made the trauma possible are proclaimed, shared, and transmitted, this past continues in the present and impacts on the future. Ethnic and imperial nationalism, anti-Semitism, and racism are toxic ideologies that celebrate white supremacy and violence negate human rights and undermine democracy. They deepen the fault lines in the society and they polarize nations and they thrive in aggressive wars, as we see today. The main goal of remembering in such a context is to bring a toxic history to an end. This is a social, cultural, and political task in which the separate functions of remembering and forgetting can no longer be neatly separated. Remembering in order to overcome and forget acquires a whole set of new meanings, such as to learn, to understand, to acknowledge, to change, to regret, to mourn, and to prevent. It is a form of remembering that is committed to historical truth and human rights, stressing what humans and communities have in common rather than flagging 
what keeps them apart. It is the form in which cultural memory can merge with memory culture. This task of memory culture was succinctly summed up by a young poet, namely Amanda Gorman, in her poem that she recited at the inauguration ceremony of Joe Biden in January 2021. And this is what she said. Being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alida, for this, I would say, very topical and memorable lecture. We have a few minutes left for some questions this time from the audience, and there are two volunteers who will help you with the microphone. So if you want to ask something or make a comment, please raise your hand and wait till the mic comes to you. So please use the opportunity. There is the first one here. It works now. Okay, so uh, thanks for your presentation. It was uh, very thrilling and insightful. So uh, would you agree that the function of cultural memory not only is to look into the past, but to anticipate the future? And by anticipate the future, I don't mean just predicting what's going to happen, but to take actions in the present so we can uh, premediate things uh, from our past don't happen in the future again. Okay, I think the first thing we have to revise is uh, still very deeply anchored vision um, of temporal uh, ordering, which uh, I refer to as the modern time regime. And this is the idea that <clears throat> we live in the present. The present is just a moment, a transitory moment, when the future uh, actually uh, is transformed into the past. It, it, there is no extension of the present in this time regime. And <clears throat> all expectations is, is oriented towards the future. The future will bring everything. It's the Eldorado of all our wishes, of progress, of promise. And whatever is past is behind us. It is a dead weight. You know, as as uh, Hannah Arendt said, uh, the dead load, it will sink into oblivion by the mere force of time. This, is, this concept of the rush of time, the flow of time, and the forgetting be, being brought by... Uh, the mere flow of time, this is part of this normative model that is still so deeply anchored in our heads that it takes a lot of um, learning and studying and also persuasion to understand that memory does not follow this temporal uh, logic at all. We have to get out of it. And I think um, Lottmann was the first who started this uh, public enterprise to teach people that the past is not... Uh, automatically passed because it is passed. And uh, the, the whole notion of memory, when he said <clears throat> uh, memory is, uh, cultural memory is not just a um, storing mechanism, ideas grow there. Of course, whatever is kept in and retained in memory is retained there for the future. These are not only the seats, as we heard last night, I think, in the public um, address that was given us at the uh, in, the, in the town hall, uh, not only seeds. It, it is the, the actually the basis and the grounding of what we do in the present and in the future. Um, so memory and the past is the past has to be uh, 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 the, the future and the present have to be inscribed into the past. Otherwise, it would not work. And uh, whenever we decide now, as I said and I, how I rephrased. Um, what memory um, and remembering does, one of the very important things is to end toxic ideologies. And uh, that is a way <clears throat> of not forgetting them, the opposite, because they can thrive and survive in the mode of silence, which I showed you could be a form of even stabilizing uh, these things, um, like statues in the southern states, in the United States of 
of generals who promoted slavery uh, and to this day. So <clears throat> um, these are the foundations that uh, determine our future. And uh, we have to um, analyze what we are grounded on and if we di discover that these things that come from the past um, do not meet with contradiction or controversy or discussions and are uh, re-narrated, uh, re re they will exert a continuous influence on our future. So um, the point is that as soon as we start to talk about memory <clears throat> as a constructive uh, agent for the past, uh, present and the future, we have to accept that the fact that it has something to do with the, with the past does not mean that this is all over. And now we turn to pre-saging pre, um, <clears throat> uh, or to predicting technologies. Uh, what will the future bring? No, we have to decide what do we bring into the future in order to cope with the challenges and uh, problems that the future brings. Was that uh, understandable? Absolutely. OK. Thank you. One more question? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about uh, traumatic memories because you also mentioned it in your presentations. Uh, considering that uh, in your book, Shadows of Trauma, you mentioned that traumatic memory works uh, is a little bit different because it cannot integrate into our uh, into ourselves because it's traumatic. So would you agree uh, that traumatic memory functions a little bit differently from other kinds of memories that, um, that, that, it, that it cannot function normally as other kind of memories which regulate our daily behaviors in the follow? It, it's really interesting how uh, the concept of trauma came back. In the 20th century, of course, there was excessive uh, trauma and also to be observed empirically connected to the first the great war, as the English terminology has it, the first world war. Um, <clears throat> and there was already um, theories and technologies of um, dealing with trauma. But Freud was the big obstacle in this discourse because he did not acknowledge trauma as a, as a, as a real uh, injury, and he thought it had to do with uh, dreams and wish fulfilling and, and stuff like that, which really held back uh, the development of this um, coping or theorizing trauma more adequately. And his colleague, Janet, who is about the same age, whom Freud really tried to um, uh, marginalized throughout his life. He was uh, constantly focused on trauma and created a very interesting trauma theory. But all of this took time, and it was only the Vietnam War veterans who brought back their trauma into the midst of the society, and there was no longer a way to stop uh, taking trauma seriously. So uh, 1980 is the date when it entered the medical uh, handbook and became an officially acknowledged, um, uh, not injury, but disorder. And this, uh, some trauma theorists say this was a big mistake and actually um, violation versus the victims because uh, disorder sounds like somebody's, something is wrong with you, whereas injury, um, <clears throat> uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, is the D. And it should be J, uh, post-traumatic stress injury, um, because <clears throat> it is always uh, related to an injury and not just a disorder. But this whole discourse uh, started in 1980, and I wonder whether Lotman ever became, uh, <laughs> came in relation to it. Maybe he, um, it was not part of his uh, uh, semiotic world, and it would have perhaps changed some of his assumptions, but I think they can be easily introduced into his uh, also semi-spheric um, concepts. Um, they make it, they complexify it much more because, the, the, as I said, this is why I've emphasized my whole presentation on the modes of forgetting. I 
think it is too shallow to speak uh, of modes of forgetting as just a receding of something into some background and returning. And the effect of returning is always making things more complex and better. There is an inbuilt uh, theory of progress there. More complexity is more progress. So there is this modernist hope or optimism working <clears throat> that we will get better <clears throat> if we have more information and if things, structures become more complex. But we have overlooked in this only mode of um, thinking <clears throat> that the structures of forgetting are more complicated, that there are <clears throat> uh, pathological uh, structures on the one hand, which I related to trauma on the one, but there are also <clears throat> toxic um, foundational myths and, and histories that um, shape the values of the society, even though they may have, um, uh, like in the southern states, they have lost the war, but they continue their statues. And this is uh, very much also the, what happened in Germany after the First World War. That was the loss of a war from the point of view of Hitler. <clears throat> and he, st he started to erect his monuments, you know, um, for his lost cause and then created the Nazi regime. And in a, a similar way, because Hitler was also in co close contact with the southern generals uh, or states, um, he admired those generals because of the south, because they had erected, um, they wanted to erect um, a slave regime, just like he wanted to, a very ethnic, uh, white supremacy re regime, and there was a lot of um, response and, and resonance in Nazi Germany for those ideas. And these ideas uh, continue to the present in the South. They are sort of like in a, in a <clears throat> cap encapsulated uh, history in this larger uh, assortment of different re references to the past. And this is what I call a toxic uh, history. And in order to, to address these, um, it's not enough to forget them or to neutralize them. They, the only way of neutralizing them is to work through. And this is where we need the therapeutic um, vocabulary that we get. We have to take the, the soul of humans into account, not just the brain, and um, have to look how these different centers within the person interact, which I think, again, is in the a vein of, of Lottmann's thinking because he expressly said cultural memory must have something to do with historical experience and with the analogy of uh, individual and collective, uh, of the collective. So I think we are still in the framework of Lottmann's uh, semiotics or semiospheres, but we have uh, a lot of work to do to um, specific, make some of these uh, territories in this larger map a little bit uh, more complex and more specific to fit our um, uh, yeah now very contemporary and very uh, dramatic situation. And maybe one last short question. Oh, I, I had actually two, but <laughs> now I have to <coughs> think what is. Um, well, I can just raise the question, and you don't have to answer it, but I'm sure, you know, there is uh, an interesting discussion that uh, the analogy between individual and, and collective memory, how far should it go? Because, of course, there is a huge research about, uh, you know, in neuroscience about memory, and especially I thought it was very interesting about your triggers, because, like, this... Uh, you know, neuroscience suggests that it is very much connected with spatial orientation, so then these kind of spatial triggers are, you know, extremely important. So, I mean, how far could we actually go in this? Um, but my second question was basically, what is, you know, in your opinion, was this kind of <coughs> critical mass that helped, um, like, Germany and, yeah, well, you speak about Germany in the 1980s to um, address this, you know, painful questions, so, like, what's your advice for those who <laughs> haven't yet managed to address them yet? <coughs> well, thank like, you. Sorry, if I, maybe we take also the other question from the gentleman behind you, yes, and then you can answer it all hmm. three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I sympathize with most of what, what you said, but I had one query pertaining to the biological anchoring of different types of memory, in the sense that... Um, the coins of memory you're referring to have a very uh, either episodic or mythological 
slash narrative nature, whereas those that are pivotal in providing therapy for those negative experiences, be they traumatic or stemming from toxic types of culture, seem to have a much shorter evolutionary history and are, all, and are therefore also far more shallow. Okay, very, very interesting questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for the individual um, <clears throat> collective uh, question. I think um, the best way, of course, uh, we have to really <clears throat> um, totally abandon any um, association or even metaphor of, of, of a collective, you know, as a kind of agent or persona uh, that would be um, terribly essentializing and going against the, totally against the uh, uh, <clears throat> interests of a semiotic theory of culture, which where we always relate to signs and what humans do with the signs, you know, how in history uh, these constructs are created. So uh, we are starting with constructivism here, and uh, we are very we fight against any kind of uh, that kind of essentialism also of, of nations as spirits or essences or souls and so forth. Um, but Halifax, I think, is very helpful here because um, his um, idea of um, connecting the individual with a group. Um, and you can learn a lot about um, <clears throat> that relationship when you follow him, because every individual has his or her own uh, experiences, individual memory, but also family memory, which already is a group memory in which he is you know, entangled. But then also joining a group or living in a state and uh, going to school and being in a semiosphere of a culture means also that cognitively you learn about uh, the history of this, this culture and you become um, a member and you can even participate if you take, um, oh yeah, take this uh, chance to either uh, participate in the, in the yearly rights uh, that I uh, refer to, but you don't have to, of course, in a democracy, no more, nobody is, is um, actually, there is no <clears throat> pressure to do this, but um, also in the sense that you place your own history in the history into which you emigrate. This is right now a very important uh, issue that um, national narratives have to change because they are too tight to <clears throat> give room to emigrants, their histories, and also their perspectives on the dominant history of the society right now, which I, uh, in, um, which I related to with this <clears throat> example of this um, pharmacy <clears throat> name that is being discussed in, in Germany right now. So definitely uh, we have the possibility that as humans to uh, entertain many memberships and the membership in a collective is one of all the others and it does not override <laughs> any of the um, others. Um, so the quest next question was uh, the German memory uh, and what uh, made that possible and because in a way it was de definitely um, uh, also related to our culture memory work uh, because um, I went back to the 1980s and emphasized uh, the uh, Kopelev episode which I found relevant today but I could have also gone back to the 80s and uh, highlight the historian's struggle, which or the historian's debate, which took place there, and the question was for the first time, uh, what is history and what is memory? So that was a, a moment uh, of revelation for us. For the first time, we noticed um, public uh, shared memory is something that is relevant, and it is now a matter of deciding what to put in it and what to leave out, like the bottleneck, what what gets in and what stays out. And um, is it enough that the historians know about the Holocaust or shouldn't the citizens um, uh, also of the country uh, where this history in a way persists because um, all the buildings are still there, you can point to everything, it's there's still the scene where it happens, this crime. Uh, should it be lost um, or should even be those um, migrants who now uh, join this national community, should they be involved? And so the idea was, yes, it, it makes sense, and it's not only a matter of, uh, now in the third and fourth generation, a matter of um, 
connecting to a family guild, which would be an ethnicized um, notion of, of history, but also a matter of responsibility. You, you live in the state and you share this history, um, and um, it's um, not the guilt that is your responsibility, but the responsibility is that it will not repeat, be repeated. So again, it's a, another kind of a framing uh, which has uh, more to do and not so much with the pride issue, that which I emphasized with the help of Nietzsche. It's not about the violation of pride. Um, it's more uh, about um, alerting um, the sense of responsibility and, and uh, being awake, pu uh, politically awake and engaging um, in um, the um, support uh, for democracy, I would, I would argue. And um, the last uh, question had to do with the, <clears throat> um, with the deepness, the deepness of the anchoring of uh, memories. Um, you mentioned the episodic, mythological, and this negative memory. Um, it's, it's sort of not all exactly on the same level. Um, I would argue there are, when, when it comes to the emotions, there are deeper emotions and perhaps more shallow emotions but because they need to be worked through the intellect and therefore they might, you might think they are sh more shallow, uh, but I wouldn't uh, say so. They are more complex, uh, they are uh, more important. If we only um, are led through our deepest emotions, it would be the amygdala, it would be the, the basic emotions that um, um, steer us, but um, this is why I distinguish between um, two types of nation states. I call them the civil um, nation state and the other is the um, militant nation state. So you can uh, create states on the basis of different kinds of emotions. And this is, these are choices that I think today are very important. You can build them on a kind of patriotic uh, pride that uh, includes a very aggressive movement towards the other. And in Germany, this, this was uh, defined by Carl Schmidt as the basic um, <clears throat> relationship between the self and the other is to know who is my enemy. I cannot know who is my, who I am myself before I know who is my enemy. So your own self is premised on this other as the enemy whom you have to overcome and, uh, and, and exterminate in a way. So this, this was for a long time um, the anthropology of, of Western history and culture when we think of um, imperialism, we always needed uh, an enemy of this kind to, to overcome and to show our strength. And um, I wouldn't call this more shallow or uh, less, um, uh, only shorter. It has, the shortness only has to do that we are at a historical moment when this type of memory is only being form, formed. I'm talking here about a um, history of 33 decades. It's a very short history. But I think um, um, standing at, at the point where we are, I think that the retrospective faculty of humans is becoming uh, more elaborate, um, uh, now turning away from the sense that everything is forgotten that is past. We um, just right now um, generate a sense that there is something like a responsibility for the history, even if it's um, <clears throat> past and there are decades that uh, and even a century that uh, separates us from it. So this notion of responsibility extend, um, extended to the past is uh, another form of creating a stance actually for the future. And the future that if in that respect has to do with sustainability. Peace is the most sustainable mode of existence um, that is possible. And um, uh, from this point of view, of course, you can al also um, uh, confront and uh, uh, the, the most challenging um, problems of our life today, which is uh, the uh, crisis of the planet. So all of these things actually go together if you take them together. And uh, from that point of view, oh, yes, it is a short, a short history. Um, to gain this uh, greater complexity, also uh, emotion-wise with respect to your own history, but I think it, it has a, a future and it is the future.
Thank you very much for your very thorough answers. And uh, let me once again ask you to thank Alida for this wonderful performance. Thank you. Okay. And now it's their lunchtime, and then we will continue with our parallel sessions. So thank you.